the mainstream idea is that a virus appeared on the scene that uh, some in the Western context, some promiscuous gay men were the first to catch it, but they were just unlucky, and that in time it was going to spread to everybody. Um, that has been questioned from the start by some scientists who hypothesized that instead um, AIDS should be seen, AIDS in that Western context should be seen, um, one aspect of it should be seen that it's a lifestyle induced um, disease that some uh, particular guys who were leading a lifestyle where um, they had many partners and they were using a lot of drugs and they were taking prophylactic antibiotics to fight off the next bout of the clap, these kind of things, that it was an unhealthy lifestyle and people were, in a way they knew that, but they, they felt so strongly that they wanted to stand up for gay rights and gay lib that they were putting themselves at risk through this lifestyle. And the argument is that this proved to be biologically damaging and that it was pushing down, suppressing the immune system, damaging the immune system over a period perhaps of years before AIDS as, a, as a, the collapse of the immune system came on the scene. For, for decades, um, homosexual relationships had been viewed not simply as something that was impolite but as something like a disease and um, many gay men had grown up in the, in the 40s, 50s, feeling really marginalized, feeling that they didn't understand themselves, feeling that they, their gender predisposition and their sexual predispositions were, were uh, you know, really disliked and, and marginalized by society. And there was, it was in connection with um, the greater, more liberal attitudes towards sex that came in the in the um, 60s especially, um, and running through into the 70s, that um, gay men felt, right, now is our chance to assert our right to live the lives that we, we wish, to have the sex lives that we wish and we feel that are right for us. That was the kind of background to it. So there was a lot of feeling that, um, that almost like the more partners you could have, the more you were striking a blow for gay lib. And I remember talking to Michael Callan, one of the people who was at the forefront of that lifestyle at that time, and he very much felt like it was, uh, if he did have another bout of syphilis or gonorrhea, whatever it might be, and he had many, many infections over the years, that it was like a notch, another a victory notched up for his right to exist as a gay man. It was a, a breakout from the suppression that had existed previously. There was a big list of drugs, but I think possibly one of the most uh, pernicious was what was regarded as one of the most harmless, which was poppers, these amyl nitrite inhalants that were said to um, help in gay sex, that they relaxed um, the anal sphincter, uh, but they also gave you a high in general. And a lot of gay parties at that time apparently were full of the fug of um, people uh, sniffing these volatile chemicals. Um, but I learned um, when looking into these alternative ideas about the causation of AIDS that amyl nitrite is a actually strips the lungs of the lung cells of glutathione, which is a very protective substance. So these may well, far from being harmless as they were marketed at the time, um, they may well have been one of the major factors that was producing the immune suppression that was to lead on to full-blown AIDS. I think that the, um, uh, this action that the nitrite inhalants had of, of stripping the lung cells of their glutathione, which is a very protective substance, this would definitely have made these guys more vulnerable to one of the AIDS, early AIDS-defining diseases of, of this um, bacterial pneumonia that was, one of, was seen as a, uh, as a a marker disease of AIDS right from the very beginning. I do remember seeing a study that of the first hundred or so gay men diagnosed with AIDS that um, their, their cumulative lifetime partners were up around 1200 each um, and they weren't that old. Um, it was a high, ne high level number of partners that, that were recalled and the drugs were very much a part of that lifestyle. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The probable cause of AIDS has been found. Credit must go to our 
eminent Dr. Robert Gallo, who directed the research that produced this discovery. This is a very interesting turn of events because this was when Margaret Heckler and Bob Gallo launched HIV. In effect, it became a, a marketing campaign for the whole concept of HIV as the cause of AIDS. Even though, <clears throat> even though the, uh, Mrs. Heckler uh, referred to it as uh, the probable cause of AIDS, um, it was the way that it was spoken of was that this is, this is it, guys. And it was on the same day, I think, that the patent application was made for an HIV test. And um, it was announced that this test was available um, that would identify people who had um, become infected. And it was also promised that within a couple of years, there would be a vaccine. Um, it really was... Um, it really was a most extraordinary, powerful launch with, with government scientists and top governmental officials authenticating a particular view of HIV AIDS. But it came after a period where one can understand some of the pressures that the people were facing. Early on, um, the Reagan administration that, that was in, in, um, in power at the time had been unsympathetic towards the early AIDS cases. It had been argued that it's a gay plague, you know, it's something that there was, it was a right-wing administration, there was something of the feeling of that they brought it on themselves. This kind of unsympathetic attitude, we don't necessarily do that with any other illnesses. And so both the gay community and, the, and their doctors, who are often gay themselves, were very angry, uh, not surprisingly, that this um, a dismissive attitude had been taken. And that dismissive attitude and the fact that normal levels of help were not even being, and concern were not even being expressed towards these guys who were dying, that also led to this tremendous desire on the part of the, day com the gay community that AIDS should be defined other than as a gay plague, which was, you know, the way it was being characterised in those early years. Um, because it was felt that if, it was going to if we were going to carry on looking at, at it like that, then it would mean that um, this, this uh, marginalised status would remain and a lot of people might die from this very frightening condition. Um, so uh, this was one reason why there was enormous pressure on the government, having, having um, taken that lax line in, those, in that first period, first few years of AIDS, uh, there was very great pressure building up from the gay community, from the medical community, to look at this differently. And when Gallo said, we've found a virus, it's the cause of AIDS, we've got a blood test, we're on track, boys, science is going to, this is a breakthrough for American science, we're going to lick this one, you know, lick this, this big virus pretty soon, vaccine will come, we'll get drugs. Everybody breathes a kind of sigh of relief because that was what they wanted to hear. So it was in that context that there was such massive interest in this press conference and also the way the... Even though, at this point, nothing had appeared in the scientific press to support this, the, this thesis that a new virus was the cause of AIDS, despite that fact, the scientific community was also very ready to go with this, um, partly bit out of concern uh, and sympathy with the gay community, but also because of this background that in the war on cancer, the, a virological approach had been taken and had not really led anywhere, and there were a lot of virologists who had reached the end of the line in terms of funding and, and promise in the hope that, of finding a virus cause for cancer. And um, the virological community was also very ready and, and willing to take on board the idea that this new condition um, was something that would eventually become a big threat to humankind and that their services were therefore needed to investigate it and to defeat it. The, the syndrome was new. AIDS as a syndrome in, in these gay men was, was new. It, uh, the, um, it hadn't been seen in a particular uh, section of society before in this way. And so there was rightful concern um, to want to get to the bottom of this. But, um, but one of the um, characteristics of the syndrome, as we look back on it now with hindsight, is that the diseases that were said to be 
um, killing AIDS patients were not new in themselves. What was said to be new was that the immune system was being suppressed by this virus that had appeared from the African forest or wherever, and that this virus was therefore the, the target of the virological community's efforts to defeat AIDS. It wasn't that pneumocystic pneumonia was new. It was a well-known condition that could hit immunosuppressed people, that could hit people malnourished, for example, in the African context. Many children have, have harboured and have died from this bacterial pneumonia. Even Kaposi's, another of the Kaposi's sarcoma, this, this cancer that was afflicting those early AIDS patients, that subsequently came to be seen as caused by another virus, um, at least this is the argument, that uh, although there's also an argument that it was a direct consequence of, of nitrite usage. But um, again, the mainstream view was that although it's another virus, that virus was able to uh, get a foothold in the patient because their immune system had been damaged by this new HIV. So this was the thinking that went on behind this. Even though the diseases themselves weren't new, the actual diseases that were crippling the patients and, and in some instances were their, the cause of their death, but it was felt that underneath that, in order to explain why in relatively young people they were going down with these diseases, that there must be something else. And the, the lifestyle um, explanation proved politically unacceptable, but the virus explanation pr proved very, very acceptable to many different parties. Gallo created the, the um, ELISA-style test um, and marketed that as, um, a, as a product that could tell you that you were at risk of AIDS or that you, you were infected with AIDS. Um, the big mistake that happened there was that the test was never validated as demonstrating the presence of virus. Uh, if you're going to validate a, a, a diagnostic test, you need to be able to show, in, unless in exceptional circumstances you might have a, you know, might have a hunch that you go another way, but, but then you'd have to be extremely cautious about what you're going to do with that. It might just be a pointer in a particular direction. But if you're going to tell someone that they are infected with a, a lethal virus that is going to take your life, is going to cause this collapse of your immune system, you need to be extremely careful what you're doing with that. Unfortunately, that care was not taken. Um, Gallo was unable to find virus in AIDS patients. He was unable to find virus in, in um, people at risk of AIDS. He claimed in those early papers in 1984 that he'd isolated, but he used the term isolation extremely loosely. He, he used it to refer to some marker signals of activity in the cultures that he worked with that he interpreted as meaning the presence of this virus, but he was never actually able to find particles of HIV and purify them and show that they were HIV, show that they were a unique virus that, uh, uh, that was just in these patients who tested positive, and that patients who didn't test positive didn't have this same, these same particles present in them. He only managed to make the genetic phenomena that he termed um, HIV become apparent by, through a very, very long procedure of stimulating um, cell culture, co-culturing cells from patients with other cells from other patients and kicking them with chemicals and mixing them in cell lines which themselves are known to be highly active like um, a leukemic cell line and he eventually obtained some signals coming out of this but there was no reason actually at that point to interpret that as meaning that he'd proved that, that he had a, a, new, a new virus isolated and proven and, and therefore because he hadn't managed to do that he also was not justified in claiming that this this blood test this so-called HIV test was diagnostic for HIV the purpose of the of presenting the world with a an HIV test as it came to be called was twofold as I would understand it one was that it was, would be there to protect blood supplies, the safety of blood supplies. And in fact, the HIV test, as marketed by Gallo and um, associates, 
was valuable for that purpose because the, the test does discriminate blood that has been donated by people who, whose immune systems may have been activated in such a way that they have raised levels of these antibodies that the test looks for. And raised levels of those antibodies can be associated with ill health. There's no question of that. That's how the test was actually set up. But what the test does not do, which, which was also claimed for it, unfortunately, by Gallo and others, is act as a diagnostic for the presence of HIV in individuals or in communities. It's not fit for doing that. And yet it came to be seen as something that would be, you know, if you tested positive, then it meant you were infected and therefore you should be a candidate for all sorts of of uh, changed aspects in your life and ultimately that you would become a candidate for taking antiviral drugs and all the rest. The CDC um, started testing groups of healthy people, uh, people um, from different groups across America and on the basis of these screening surveys concluded that about a million people were HIV positive within America already. The, th the interesting fact is that in some 20 years of AIDS, that level has not changed. So the test may have been picking up a background level of ill health because there's a whole range of conditions that can cause you to test positive, to have raised levels of the antibodies that the test looks for. Big range of conditions. Some more than 60 have been documented in the, in the official medical literature, and there are probably more than that. Many, many different things like you can test positive after a, um, a bout of flu or a series of flu jabs. You can test positive in pregnancy, especially repeated pregnancy. You can test positive if you've been exposed to the tuberculosis microbe, or um, it, not just if you've got TB, but if you have a, a friend, a close contact who's got TB. There's a big range of these conditions that can cause you to test positive that have nothing to do with some new virus. but uh, which, which is, and the fact that, that the level of background raised levels of these antibodies, this million, sort of one in 250 or so people, one in 300 in the States, who are said to have these raised levels of these antibodies, that doesn't tell us anything, in fact, about who is infected with some deadly new disease. It just tells us that there's a certain level of background ill health which, uh, which is picked up by this uh, this non-specific test. What was the purpose of the 1986 meeting in Geneva and how many people were in attendance? In 1986 there was a, a meeting in Geneva of experts on blood screening from different parts of the world, about a hundred attended. And the aim, the primary aim of the meeting was to look at the implications of the HIV announcements and understanding uh, the implications for blood safety and the safety of blood products. And there was quite a lot of discussion about how um, the HIV test could be used for protecting blood supplies. But it's also most interesting that at that meeting, a number of uh, delegates present spoke of the impossibility. They were completely frank about the fact that this was not a diagnostic test. This test was was, it was in the nature of it that it could tell it broadly um, it could protect your blood supplies because it actually selected out for people whose immune systems had been activated in a particular way by any of these more than 60 conditions as we now know. Um, and definitely there was a relationship from the way that the test was actually set up. There was a relationship between testing positive and risk of AIDS. But it did not tell you anything about being infected with a specific virus. Um, and they were quite frank that that was the case. They said it can't be used. The way the test has been established, it cannot be used to diagnose HIV infection. And they were really um, embarrassed about that fact. But, um, and I remember, I think it was one representative from the FDA who was saying that, that uh, it's wrong to use it that way, but you know, the way it's getting used um, is in that way, and what can we do about it? It's as if it's all taken on a life of its own. But they were embarrassed by this fact. They also were extremely doubtful about whether any confirmatory test would be possible because of the nature of the, 
the original announcements about HIV, the, the, the FDA re representative was asked if there were, were, was a likelihood of, of um, more efficient confirmatory diagnostic tests, genuine diagnostic tests, um, in the pipeline. And he said, no, he was completely pessimistic about that possibility because he was very clear that it was in the nature of the, of the, um, the beast, if you like, that we were talking about here, that it wasn't a specific virus. It was, a, it was a, the antibodies that were being ascribed to this virus had never been proved to be such. This is an incredibly important point. And it's amazing to me, really, that this vital meeting, the pressures were such, clearly, socially and politically, that they, even though they knew that this test was being wrongfully used and that it could not be used to diagnose infection with HIV, should that exist, they knew this, and yet they allowed it to go forward because they felt that the public health considerations were so important. It's like they'd taken on board the the concern, the fear, the idea uh, that HIV was out there and threatening to kill everyone who was sexually active. And because they'd taken that idea on board, they didn't stop or speak out about the reality that this HIV test does not specify the presence of a specific virus. They knew it. It was there. It's, it, the, I came across a, a report of this 1986 meeting. Uh, I found it in London. Uh, some years back, and it's just amazing how clear they were about this, but also how embarrassed they were that they, they couldn't speak out about it. Because there is, because of the peculiar nature of this HIV test, that it does not actually relate back to a, a purified, examined, studied virus. Instead, it's a, it's a selection of proteins assumed to belong to the virus. And I'll say more in a minute about you know, how, they, how that was, those proteins were selected. It's very important. But um, because of this difficulty that it doesn't relate to a particular virus, um, there's never been any, any agreement on um, what level of, of reactivity um, is truly indicative of the presence of this virus, this purported virus. So um, the strange thing is that in one country, you might, um, so let's say you're reactive on two of the Western blot bands, that is, two proteins that are in the Western blot test, your, your blood, when it, your blood is exposed to it, it's reactive, indicating that you have antibodies to those two proteins. Um, in another country, it may be that three of, reactivity to three proteins in the Western blot test is required before that's considered confirmatory of HIV infection. In the UK, because our scientists feel that the Western blot is worthless as a confirmatory test, understanding, I think, what was outlined in that 1986 meeting, that it simply saying the same thing in a different way. So in the, in the UK, um, no amount of HIV proteins testing positive with Western blot would make any difference to a diagnosis. What they do there is they won't actually call you HIV positive unless you've repeatedly tested positive with an ELISA test. And also, they're a very subjective factor. You're, you've got some risk factor in your life which allows them to assume that you've got the infection. So there's a recognition in a way that the test in itself is not enough to diagnose the presence of HIV. Um, the, it, it, the presence of it is only inferred when, if the patient also has some risk factor in their life associated with AIDS, such as a promiscuous gay sex or uh, exposure to a lot of other people's blood, such as with a haemophiliac. You can be considered, uh, because, of the, because of the different criteria that apply in different countries, you can be considered you can test HIV positive in one country and be given an AIDS diagnosis as a result of that, whereas in another country you won't test HIV positive and you won't be given an, an AIDS diagnosis, even though the, the, you know, you, you, your, the blood sample might have been the same um, and the interpretation of it the same, but because one country considers two proteins to be diagnostic and another one requires three, for example, then you travel from country requiring three to where you're an AIDS patient and HIV infected and go to country, you know, 
B, where only two, sorry, I've got that the wrong way around. <laughs> you might uh, say you, you, what could happen would be that if in country A, the fact that you have two proteins uh, that react with the Western blot test, and so you will then be considered to be, in, in certain countries, you would be considered to be HIV positive, and maybe also an AIDS patient if you've got indicator illnesses. Um, you travel to another country that requires three proteins to react instead of two, and you've only got two, you won't be HIV positive and you won't be an AIDS patient. You'll just have whatever illness you might have had, such as um, TB or, or leprosy or um, some chronic intestinal infection, whatever one of the multitude of different diseases that can cause this activation of the immune system you, you're actually suffering from. At one point, um, when the FDA made some strict, stringent criteria for uh, positivity uh, with the confirmatory, so-called confirmatory test, the Western blot, they found that hardly anyone would test positive, including AIDS patients and people at risk of AIDS. So they couldn't have that. So they relaxed the criteria in order to bring more people into the, into the, um, the basket of a positive di diagnosis. No, the, 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 but this kind of fudging all stems from the, the base, the very root problem that Bob Gallo and Luc Montagnier and Robin Weiss in London, none of those early AIDS, HIV pioneers actually managed to find this purported virus and purify it and have it in quantities where you could validate these tests. The tests, instead of being validated by s analyzing those particles, by having a nice lot of it, demonstrating that it was infectious, demonstrating that there was lots of it in your AIDS patients, but not in your non-AIDS patients, um, instead of doing that, what they did was, they, because they hadn't got viruses to, um, to look at and characterize and therefore say, Specifically, these proteins are, belong to the virus and therefore these antibodies are indicative of a reaction to that virus. Instead of doing that, what they did was they took the um, filtered material that they were working with, which had a number of, a, a kind of soup of different proteins for, uh, that arise, arose there at the end of their, their long culturing procedure where they were looking for HIV but never found it, they took that soup and they had to decide which of these proteins shall we use to indicate the presence of HIV. They actually, they should never have done that. That was not science at that point. Um, because the, the true way of the gold standard for, for confirming a diagnostic test is that you show that the proteins you use in your test belong to the virus. They couldn't find the virus, so what did they do? They saw which proteins were most reactive with the blood of patients with AIDS or at risk of AIDS. They then concluded that, okay, these guys have got HIV, uh, that's already their assumption, so to speak, so well, we find that these proteins are most reactive with them, therefore these guys have got antibodies to these, these proteins, therefore these proteins, out of the big sort of mix of proteins that they've got, will select the ones that are most reactive with the blood of AIDS patients. Completely closed circuit reasoning. It's astounding that such a mistake could have happened and could have been accepted. In countries um, such as those some parts of Africa where um, A, you may not be able to afford um, more than one test, so you, don't, you certainly can't afford repeated testing. In some, many parts of Africa you can't even afford a single test. But the World Health Organization became so convinced on the basis of the fact that many people in Africa test positive when screening surveys were done with these new HIV tests back in the 1980s, mid-1980s, up to 50-60% of populations were found to be testing positive. So the American scientists who were marketing this idea, and UK scientists also, were saying, look guys, these people over here, there's, you know, there's huge percentages of them infected with this virus. This is obviously where it came from. It came out of Africa. Um, 
many of these countries are going to be decimated by AIDS, which is just a matter of time. And this was you know, actually based on junk science that these statements were made. It's a tragedy. But ever since that time, these nations, whole nations, have been led to believe that, in some instances, that they've got large percentages of their population infected and, and doomed because of this sexually transmitted, supposed sexually transmitted virus. It's such a tragedy. Um, in those countries, the, as the World Health Organization and other experts sort of took on board the, this idea that, ah, there's, there's such a huge numbers infected in Africa, we've really got to do something about this, something you know, that requires us to go even beyond this, the use of this, this unvalidated and invalid HIV test. Well, we, we won't even require any testing because in most parts of Africa it can't be afforded. It costs something like $25 a test. And in many, in, I think a, the average annual expenditure per person in sub-Saharan Africa is something like $8 per annum. So it's very expensive stuff. Um, but what the WHO did was allow a, diag a presumptive diagnosis of AIDS on the basis of certain symptoms, which are actually symptoms that are very common among malnourished people in Africa. Symptoms like um, prolonged um, cough, uh, symptoms like um, um, pneumonia, symptoms. Sim uh, there's, a, there's a range of these things that can actually be, that there could almost be a description of some of conditions such as TB, uh, which is immensely widespread in poor countries and which has been clearly demonstrated to be one of the illnesses that puts into your bloodstream raised levels of these antibodies which are then interpreted by the HIV test as the presence of HIV but which actually have no relevance whatsoever to this mythical entity. Um, but the, the Perth group of scientists um, who have been on to the fact that HIV was never isolated and purified and therefore never worked with in producing the HIV test and therefore the HIV test has never been validated. They were onto that right back in the, in the early, uh, about 84 when the blood test came out. And um, they have subsequently shown that all the proteins which are held to specify the presence of this unique new virus are actually they've been able to show that all the proteins that are held to specify the presence of this purported new virus, they can all be, they all belong to other, uh, there are other reasons for all of them. They're, they're naturally present in, in the cells in the body. They're embarrassed. Um, the, the scientists have been embarrassed about this. They know that it's flawed. They do believe that what they're doing is the right thing. They, they got it into their heads that there was a retrovirus there. They kind of fudged the science in the rush to come up with a, a viral explanation. And then everyone gathered round there. Everyone seemed to like the idea. So they thought, well, yeah, we've got to be right about this then. And so they went forward with that. But, and I, I've got a lot of sympathy for the, those people, actually. I think now that they're they're really worried because on the one hand, what they did was useful. It helped protect the blood supplies. But on the other hand, it's led to this crazy situation where you're telling millions of people in poor countries who are down enough already, you're telling them that they're infected with a deadly virus. You're, 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 you're telling them that they need antiviral drugs which are not specific to their problems. You're telling them that they needed to spend more money on HIV tests and on condoms and all the rest of it. Rather, that even UNAIDS and, and um, the WHO have even told some of these countries you should cut down on your spending on education and other health expenditures to cope with this AIDS crisis. It's just a tragedy. And that's going to be killing so many people. I, th I certainly think that, um, that anti-poverty campaigns are the are the answer. Um, the, one of the problems in all of this, which is a strange thing, is, is that certainly if we go on recent history, when Africa's problems or any other poor country's problems were said to be because they were poor, you know, they just didn't have enough money to eat and therefore a lot of people died, we didn't really show that much interest in the wealthy countries. Just said, oh well, you know, that's Africa. But when African diseases 
poverty related, I'm quite sure, um, became redefined as AIDS, then world interest suddenly developed and money has been available. The tragedy is that the money that's coming in is not being used appropriately. If it was being used to, to defeat tuberculosis or uh, even more fundamentally to de defeat the poverty and the malnutrition that creates the circumstances in which diseases like tuberculosis become so widespread, if, the, if that was how the money was being used, then it would be a wonderful outcome, a, a happy ending, if you like, to this story of HIV. And that's what I would plead for. And I think that's what President Mbeki of South Africa has been pleading for. But there's so much kind of sensitivity around this, so much embarrassment at the thought that we might have got it so utterly wrong uh, that all these years we've been saying that, you know, these people are infected with this deadly virus and that they've got to take these drugs and all the rest of it and we're spending billions and billions searching for a vaccine against a virus that, that may not even exist. This is such an embarrassing thing to have to own up to that it's as if, as if people are caught between doing what they would, perhaps their heart might tell them is the right thing, that the money should go to fighting poverty and malnutrition, but at the same time it's as if they can't bring themselves to admit just what a terrible mistake has been made, and that's very understandable. I remember when I made the shift myself, because for, for the first few years of AIDS, I was reporting on this story as a, from the conventional perspective. And then I learned from one reason or another, I had a chance to go into it more deeply. I spent a week in the lab of a, of a, a, a virologist in Germany who showed me the procedures that were involved in, in isolating and purifying viruses showed me why he also didn't believe that, that this had ever been done with HIV. And um, gradually, I understood the intricacies of this story, and that allowed me to make the shift. But I, I remember being resistant to thinking that I'd been reporting this wrongly all those years. It, it takes a lot, of, a lot of, you know, kind of movement inside to be able to change direction on such an important and emotive issue as the cause of AIDS. There's a, the question has been raised, is there any reason why we should be cautious in ex accepting uh, Bob Gallo's 1984 papers? Um, I think there's every reason for caution, um, not least the fact that he, he didn't do what he claimed he had done. He did not isolate and purify HIV, and yet he'd claimed to do so. Um, there are other factors that allow us to know that Bob Gallo was a, a kind of, um, he, was ready to, he was ready to jump forward um, in what you could say was a rash way to make claims that, that uh, later would turn out not to be true. He'd done that before uh, with the claiming of, a, of, a, of a isolating a retrovirus that later turned out not to exist. And um, subsequent inquiries into the events surrounding the allegation that he'd stolen uh, samples and the virus from Luc Montagnier's laboratory and the, the changes that he made to some of the papers before they went for publication, just kind of very much with an eye to, to marketing the idea of the test and the virus rather than really being careful about the science. He was obviously something of a buccaneer in science. Still, I feel that, that he's... You know, people who know him, and I've met him a few times, I, he's a likeable guy, and if, he'd, if his gamble had paid off, he'd probably have a Nobel Prize for it. So I don't feel any kind of um, uh, sense, I don't really feel censorious about this. I just feel that, that, that the checks and balances that should, should have stopped such a mistake from becoming such a huge worldwide industry, those checks and balances don't... It's, we can't just blame Bob Gallo for the fact that those weren't in place. There's something wrong in the way science is functioning that allowed this huge development of this HIV mania to spread across the world. Gallo and Margaret Heckler and Fauci and others um, took this concept and promoted it with all the power at their disposal, NIH and the American government officials. Um, they believed in what they were doing. Um, I think that the, the real questions we should be asking ourselves is how did the scientific community, which, which prides itself on being able to pick up on gross errors in science, how did it allow itself to become bamboozled by this? And how was it that 
Some scientists, such as Peter Duisberg and the group over in Perth and others who have identified flaws in the thinking surrounding the original establishment of the HIV theory and have tried to publish on it, why was it that they were excluded from debate? Why was it that their papers were, where previously they'd often been leading members of the scientific community and medical communities, why was it that they could not raise their voices against this new idea? That's something that, that really intrigues me. What, what was it about this that went so wrong? Was it to do with the, the huge influence that NIH exerts because of its funding capabilities? Was it to do with the, the sense of urgency that came from the government because of the mistakes it had made earlier in the, in the um, outbreak of AIDS in the States? Um, is it, what, does it have to do with the dependency, um, the close interdependency between commercial interests and government science these days, institutional science? There's a, there are some very, very big questions that need to be asked about this. I've seen over the years how badly journals like Science and Nature and The Lancet have behaved on this issue. They have, they have fooled themselves into thinking that they were doing the right thing by refusing a voice to these people who were raising questions about the HIV theory. They fooled themselves by saying, but if we allow you to speak, it might weaken public confidence in what we're saying, and that could lead to more deaths. But that's not a scientific approach. You know, that they allowed themselves to be infected, if you like, by, by this emotionalism that came to surround the HIV story. And that, that, is, that is really where I think things went deeply wrong. It would be very interesting to see you know, if anything can be done in the future to help to stop that from happening again. I feel that several different interests converged when the HIV story was first propounded. And that this was also one of the problems, that there were pharmaceutical interests keen to make money from antiviral drug approaches, if that could be done. There were testing agencies, there was all the research monies that, that became available, that the burgeoning field of um, microbiology and uh, gene uh, genetics could benefit from. Um, and the journals um, who depend on ads for these you know, various biotechnical uh, advances and devices. Um, the journals, for some reason, also perhaps they they had an interest in keeping this going, a, a commercial interest even. Uh, I think that we probably in the future we need to be to be more aware that the way we see things isn't just a matter of objective assessment, but that we're all influenced by emotions uh, that that come from you know our, our personal interests our. Uh, um, our outlook on, on life, uh, our commercial and financial needs, uh, all of these things affect how we see things. And we may not be dishonest, actively dishonest, but if we don't take these factors into account in deciding, you know, about the nature of some new disease or some, some real or imagined threat to humanity, then we're going to make these same mistakes again and again and again. Another problem was that religious interests came in on this too. Um, there were probably many people in society who felt that the sexual revolution had gone too far, both whether, whether it's for gay men or straight people or whoever. And they liked the idea that if this deadly virus was circulating amongst us, you know, that in some way um, they could say, well, there we are, we told you, you know, you've got to be faithful, you've got to be monogamous. And so, in a, in a funny sort of way, I think that constituency also jumped quickly onto this HIV bandwagon and helped it forward. So there were many, many different constituencies that liked it, and they all became the AIDS establishment. Another factor in this, which is interesting, is that probably in today's world, there are not that many opportunities where we live with genuine altruism in our lives. You know, it's a hard world, a hard commercial world, fighting for survival for so many people. And AIDS, compassion towards, you know, the whole HIV AIDS idea became a, almost like an easy form of compassion. You wore the red ribbon, it meant that you were a compassionate person. You didn't even have to do anything else. 
Um, you might be carrying on as you were in your, other, in your own life, you know, with whatever kind of standards you had, but you were compassionate because you expressed that outwardly towards HIV AIDS victims. And that also has been an important element in this story, I think, that, that when that was, it was as if that would be challenged by those who questioned the HIV theory. And so that outlet or that icon of your compassion, um, if that was threatened, a lot of people became very angry and emotional, perhaps for that reason too, not realizing that by, by failing to listen to the arguments of good people, good scientists who are saying for sound reasons, hold on, there may be something seriously wrong with this whole paradigm of a, of a viral cause of AIDS, that they were damaging the gay community, they were damaging poor people in many different parts of the world and they were damaging a generation of people who grew up perhaps with a, a bogus idea that they were at risk every time they made love of picking up a, a lethal virus. When Peter Duisberg published his 1987 paper saying that HIV, arguing that HIV couldn't be the cause of AIDS, um, he was, actually at first he was greeted with silence. Nobody responded. It was an important paper published in a leading journal at that time, actually, Cancer Research, and nobody responded. Nobody. Um, and he was amazed. And he then subsequently started, because he felt that this was so important, he started to prod his colleagues to say, come on, guys, you know, look at, what I've look at the evidence I've presented here, Re react to it, respond to it. Especially when, when AZT and other drugs started to be used, um, which he believed were killing patients in large numbers, he became more and more vociferous about, about this issue. And then his colleagues in uh, previously good friends, Gallo and others, uh, in retrovirology and in the wider infectious diseases field, they became very angry with him because they felt that, well, their argument was that he was damaging the public health efforts by raising these questions. But it was also clear from some internal memos that I've seen that they were also very concerned about the reputation of science. You know, if after a few years, suddenly for someone to turn around and have to say, oh, sorry, guys, we got this wrong. Um, it's not actually a, a, a deadly new virus at all. It's just it's related to specific uh, causes in, in specific different groups of people whose immune, uh, immune systems have failed. Um, and all that that stuff about you know you all being at risk was just a, a bit of imagination on our part. I mean this is a big egg on face isn't it? So it's very hard for people to to come to that point but the longer it gets delayed the more the damage that's being done. That's what really concerns me. I'm so upset recently when in the UK um, Bono, who means well, he's a good guy, you know the front man in U2, he launched a campaign called RED which, where he's brought on board some big manufacturers, some big commercial interests, including American Express, um, Gap, various big, big uh, products. And they're, in some instances, issuing special products which a proportion of the profits will go towards the fight against HIV AIDS in Africa. And obviously it's well-meaning, but with the perspective that I have now, after studying the work of these scientists, many of them now who question this whole theory, and in fact I think have proved that it's ill-founded, um, it's a tragedy to see money going into such causes which are only worsening the problems of these poor people when their needs for support in other realistic ways are so great. Peter Duisberg was lined up to do a TV broadcast some years back and um, at the last minute they pulled the plug on having him on and then lo and behold they f he found that Fauci, Anthony Fauci was on instead. Um, the, the, I think this is an example of real failure on the part of our media up, and up to this point and I'm really, I'm really, um, I'm really interested that as well as having some kind of inquest into how the scientific community allowed these illusions to arise and continue for so long, I think there's a need for a similar examination on the part of the media. How was it that we allowed this to happen for so long? Why wasn't there a debate about the causes of AIDS when leading scientists such as Professor Peter Duisberg and others were raising these questions? Why did medical and science correspondents 
so readily dismiss them where previously they'd been regarded as eminent in their professions and suddenly they became cranks and, and uh, flat earthers and this kind of thing. You know, how come the, 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 um, uh, the, the specialists in these fields made these mistakes? I think I've got something of, re I, I think I've got something of, an, of an understanding about it from the difficulty I had in turning around in myself. But still, it's a question that we should ask because we don't want such, such massive errors to happen again in the future. What would happen if HIV did turn out to be the cause of AIDS? I mean, I th you ask me what would happen if HIV did turn out not to be the cause of AIDS. I, I think HIV totally has turned out not to be the cause of AIDS. HIV has turned out not to be, period. Um, but at the moment, we, we have this you know, a huge state of denial about the fact. The facts are in, really. It's just a matter of time, I'm quite sure, until the, the scientific and medical leaders acknowledge the scale of the error. Uh, when that comes, there'll be a period of embarrassment, but the sooner that it's faced up to and, and investigated and inquired into, the better it will be, because it'll, take, it'll be an act of courage on the part of people especially those, of course, who've been very directly involved. Maybe we can never ask them to renounce their views. I don't know. But there are other people in positions of authority around the world who can do this, who can say, OK, what's the evidence? What's the evidence for HIV as the cause of AIDS? What's the evidence that HIV is not the cause of AIDS? What's the evidence that HIV doesn't even exist, as some scientists are arguing? And this is such an important matter, especially in relation to the direction of aid to poor countries, affecting millions of lives, that it's really incumbent on us to, to you know, face up to this and examine it properly. To people watching this program who believe that HIV does cause AIDS, I would say, please take a look at the arguments in the other direction. Try to find it in your heart to recognize that a mistake might have been made, that you bought into this theory for probably for good reasons, perhaps because out of compassion for for your, your fellow men, for, for people in poor countries, whatever, um, perhaps out of uh, a sense that you didn't want to see the, the gay community return to the days when homosexuality was regarded as some kind of disease, you know, which was the case back in the 50s in some parts of the world. So a variety of reasons why people have felt so strongly about defending the HIV theory, but please understand that it's, it's really doing a lot of harm today. And especially if, if, um, if even a tenth of the, the critique that is being mounted is right, um, we should investigate and we should act on the results of that investigation. See, the sad thing is that when when someone like the president of a country, the country that is said to have the highest, proportionately the highest rates of HIV infection in the world, South Africa, when he investigates the subject seriously and he's an intelligent person, does a lot of research, given some help by a lawyer and others, some scientists who've been on there, in on this, and he briefs himself up and he finds that there are some questions that need answering, and he calls scientists of different walks of life together. People like the editor of Nature at that time and, and other uh, scientists around the world gang up on him, like kicking, a, kicking a, a, an errant schoolboy. They organize a round robin of scientists. They say it doesn't really matter whether you know anything about this subject or not, but you obviously want to condemn someone who'd be so stupid as to question the HIV theory of AIDS, just like the old church when it would you know, um, want to burn someone who was a, a heretic, who questioned the beliefs of the church. Science has been behaving just like old churchmen, not like scientists. It's really astounding. And <laughs> please, if you're watching this program, consider that this is a possibility. And look in your heart for whether there's some kind of defensiveness or upset inside you that isn't really an assessment of the facts, but just meeting some kind of emotional need that this theory may have had for you. Some people are very fortunate that they don't have these side effects. What's the, 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 the,